This video will contain spoilers for Jujutsu Kaisen chapters 110, 111, 112, and Season 2, Episode 15, otherwise known as Episode 39. So, the second season of Jujutsu Kaisen is still fluctuating, and in this series, I'm going to be analyzing the story of the series as it airs and, as a manga reader, comparing the anime to the manga to see what they pulled over directly, what they modified or expanded, and what they just straight up removed. So let's begin with the 15th episode of Season 2 of Jujutsu Kaisen. First, I'll recap the plot and explain what chapters it covered. The episode begins right where we left off last week, with Toji forcing himself into the domain through the whole Megumi open. As everyone present is confused, Toji immediately grabs Playful Cloud out of Maki's hands and tosses her away like a ragdoll. As she struggles to come to terms with the fact that she lost a battle of strength, now Bito is just shocked to see a dead man risen again before him. He notices, however, that something is off with this Toji, and we get an explanation. The seance technique Ogami used usually wears off once the cursed energy of the person she transformed runs out. Unfortunately, because the grandson's soul was without cursed energy and Toji's body that overrode it doesn't consume any cursed energy to begin with, there was effectively an infinite loop programming error where the program is looking for the specified conditions to stop running, but no such conditions ever happen, so it just keeps looping forever. In this state, Toji has become a puppet of carnage, burying his fangs at the strongest around relentlessly until the vessel breaks. To complete the programming analogy, the loop continues until the hardware crashes. Dagon immediately underestimates him due to his lack of cursed energy and gets pummeled for his mistake. As Toji continues to manhandle him, Dagon summons the strongest Shikigami he has, which resemble deep sea isopods, but even those stand no chance against Toji. Playful Cloud is the only special grade cursed tool that doesn't have a technique imbued into it. Instead, its raw power reflects that of its user. As this is the case, Maki takes note that Playful Cloud is hitting harder than she's ever seen, even when wielded by herself. She asks Naobito who he is, but his answer is a little evasive. Toji suddenly begins rubbing the two ends of Playful Cloud together, sharpening the ends into wooden stakes. Dagon notes that Megumi's domain is getting weaker, so all he has to do is buy time until he collapses and then use his sure hit effect to wipe them all out. To clarify, this wouldn't work against Toji anyway, but Dagon doesn't know that. Dagon flees upwards because, like a twitchy Call of Duty player, he only knows how to do one maneuver when caught off guard. Now Bito repeats the same counter as before, demonstrating why muscle memory drop shotting can't help you against a skilled opponent, and stopping Dagon escaping to the sky. Toji uses Playful Cloud like a pole vaulting staff to launch towards Dagon and plunges the stake into his head. Dagon attempts a Valorant second wind, but Toji breaks apart Playful Cloud and uses both stakes to turn Dagon's head into a pincushion, much like he did to Gojo's leg back in the day. As the domain disperses with Dagon's death, Nanami realizes they now have to contend with whether this guy is friend or foe. Before anyone can react, Toji already has Megumi outside on street level, having jumped through the window of the skybridge they were in. We see as Maki reacts to Megumi's abduction. Suddenly, Jogo is at Dagon's corpse, lamenting his loss. He turns his attention to the sorcerers present, as they realize what they're in for. Nanami is the first to go down, followed quickly by Maki. Now Bito manages to put up a bit of a struggle, but in his wounded state isn't as fast as he was, and he falls as well. As Jogo moves to finish the job, he reacts to the presence of Skuna appearing. He realizes it's a finger that was released, and rushes in the direction of Mimiko and Nanako. Following up from the end of a couple episodes prior, we see them force-feeding Yuji one of Skuna's fingers as Jogo arrives. He attempts to kill them, but they manage to escape. Deciding to make the most of the situation, Jogo pulls out a roll of 10 of Skuna's fingers, thinking back to Getone to telling him that while Yuji could eat all 20 of Skuna's fingers and not lose control to him, he would temporarily lose control if he were to eat 10 all at once. Jogo feeds the 10 fingers to Yuji, noting that he now has consumed 15 of them in total. 
He's distracted by Nanako and Mimiko reappearing nearby, and while holding Yuji's face, turns to deal with them, when suddenly his hand is gone. Skuna has emerged, and gives him one second to let go. Jogo retreats, and both he and the girls react to Skuna's overwhelmingly evil presence. Skuna threatens them to kneel, and while Jogo drops to a knee, Nanako and Mimiko go for the full bow. The top of Jogo's head gets lopped off as a slice flies through the air and gouges the wall behind him. Skuna admonishes him for thinking only falling to one knee would be enough. He addresses the girls, saying he'll give them one finger's worth of time to hear out what they want from him. They ask for his help in dealing with Geto, and think back to being okay with Geto being dead since it was his best friend Gojo who had killed him, but they simply refuse to accept this whole Geto situation. They hold the location of an additional finger over Skuna's head, which he doesn't much like as he sees it as them trying to order him around, so he just reduces the both of them to chunks. He turns his attention to Jogo, who clarifies that awakening him already completed their plans. He does, however, ask Skuna to make a binding vow with Yuji to maintain control, unaware of the one he's already made regarding the Enchain command that will give him one minute of control at will, so long as he doesn't hurt or kill anyone. Skuna refuses as a matter of course, but instead makes a deal with Jogo. He agrees to go along with whatever the curses have planned, starting with killing everyone in Shibuya but Megumi, if Jogo manages to land even a single hit on Skuna. Jogo accepts the deal and the episode ends. With the recap out of the way, let's go over the main points of the plot. 1. Toji takes control of the situation in Dagon's domain, killing him. 2. He takes Megumi for a walk and a little father-son bonding. 3. Jogo arrives to mourn Dagon's death and takes out Nanami, Maki, and Naobito in quick succession before jetting off when he senses the presence of one of Skuna's fingers nearby. 4. Jogo confronts Nanako and Mimiko as they feed Yuji the finger, and proceeds to feed Yuji the ten fingers he has. 5. Skuna takes over, dices the two girls, and makes a deal with Jogo to kill everyone in Shibuya except for Megumi if Jogo can manage to land a single hit on him. Now let's get into some analysis. First, I want to go over cursed tools and the ones we've already been introduced to. With Playful Cloud effectively gone after today's episode, I think it's a good time to look back on all the tools we've seen so far and discuss them. Just to get it out of the way early, let me point out the best curse tool in the series. Maki's Glasses. These allow her to see curses and are also the only example of a non-weapon curse tool we've been shown, unless you want to count the Chain of a Thousand Miles, but I would still classify that as a weapon since it's pretty easy to use a chain as a weapon whereas glasses would require you to get a little more creative, and not everybody can be John Wick. Anyway, now let's get into the weapons. Weapons are classified grades 1 to 4, depending on their strength and potency, with an additional special grade reserved for weapons that have a cursed technique imbued into them. Weapons become cursed tools when a sorcerer takes up a weapon and begins channeling their cursed energy into it. Over time, the cursed energy accumulates, turning that weapon into a cursed tool. It's important to note the distinction between fresh weapons that are new to a sorcerer that they're just channeling their cursed energy into, and actual cursed tools. The katanas we see Yuta use in the movie are just katanas he's reinforcing with cursed energy, for example. As far as I was able to find, Yuta's katanas are not cursed tools, and he freely replaces them as necessary rather than keeping one in particular to grow into a cursed tool. Similarly, Miwa's sword was said to be on the verge of becoming a cursed tool since she had been using it for as long as she had. Chronologically, from the beginning of the series, we then have the spears Maki used in the movie, Miguel's black rope, which would probably qualify as a special grade as it's imbued with a technique that disrupts other techniques while burning itself away, Slaughter Demon, which was Maki's, but Gojo took it and loaned it to Yuji, who lost it against the finger bearer team Yugumibara encountered in season 1, the blunt blade Nanami uses with its distinctive black paint splatter design, the new polearm weapon we've seen Maki using since the Goodwill event, the electric guitar we see Principal Gakuganji use, which uses his technique to convert the melodies he plays into waves of cursed energy it fires off, the weird hand sword Blonde Shithead uses, which was designed by Juzo, the guy who wanted to turn Gojo into a coat hanger. It's more powerful than most cursed tools we've seen, given its ability to act independently. 
The large sword with a black blade we saw Megumi use during the Goodwill event, which broke against the second finger bearer under the bridge. Playful Cloud, which had a storied history going from Toji to Geto to Gojo to Maki, and was the only special grade curse tool with no technique, instead acting as more of a raw power multiplier for its wielder. The Split Soul Katana, the special grade sword with the fur Tsuba we saw Toji use, which has a curse technique imbued into it that allows it to directly attack the soul of any person or object, allowing it to bypass physical resistances and cursed energy reinforcement. The Inverted Spear of Heaven, a special grade tool Toji wielded with the power to forcibly negate any techniques it comes into contact with. The Chain of a Thousand Miles, which was probably special grade, as it had a technique that allowed it to extend to any length so long as one end of the chain remained hidden from sight. The Battle Axe Mei Mei wields, which she's had long enough that it probably counts as an actual cursed tool. Nanako's Phone, which when used in tandem with her technique allows her to manipulate photographed objects. And finally, the new sword we see Megumi using with the bandage-wrapped handle and ring on the bottom. Of course, there are more to come in the future, but recapping them all like this made me realize how many more there were than I thought. Next, let's have ourselves a Juju Stroll. It's just the street Megumi and Toji jumped down to from the Sky Bridge where the fight against Dagon took place. It's right next to the Scramble Crossing. Finally, let's go over the bonus pages from the volume release of the manga. After chapter 110, we get a page with a little gag referencing a well-known variety TV show in Japan, and the fact that the Zeni name is a homonym for one way to say everyone in Japanese. After chapter 111, we get a page pointing out that it's difficult to force feed a sleeping person due to the pharyngeal reflex, otherwise known as the gag reflex, which stops things from going down your throat when you're not trying to actually swallow them to keep them out of your lungs. Your mom probably knows about it, you should ask her. After chapter 112, we get a little poem about rice plants and how they bow lower the more they grow, which is in reference to the whole bowing thing with Skuna. I searched the poem, but Google is practically useless nowadays, so I couldn't really find anything, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was a well-known poem or rhyme in East Asian culture, as it's meant to refer to humility and all. And that's my episode recap and story analysis for the 15th episode of the second season of Jujutsu Kaisen. Make sure to subscribe and turn on bell notifications if you want to be here as soon as possible each week as I put out new videos for each episode as it airs. And feel free to drop a comment with suggestions as to other videos you might like to see, such as character analysis videos or explanations. Thanks for watching.